What's up, guys? It's Fernando Cruz from Seller Tradecraft. I'm super excited today to be interviewing Connor Gillivan. So Connor is the CMO and one of the co-founders of FreeUp. And these guys are building a really, really exciting business. They're literally everywhere on Facebook and in all the conferences. So congrats to your success. And thanks so much for being here. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks for having me on today. I was glad we got connected last year. And it's exciting to be able to chat with you today. Yeah, super pumped as well. So, you know, there's not many entrepreneurs in the space that have created, you know, not one successful business, but two. And yeah, I was always really struck by that story of you guys. And yeah, I mean, I'd love to kind of hear that, like the early story and kind of how it's transitioned to what you guys are working on today. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it really all started out of our college dorm room. My business partner, Nathan Hirsch, him and I went to school together. We had some business classes together. And he early on, I think he was maybe a sophomore in college, he saw this opportunity to start buying textbooks back from students and then selling them on Amazon. So it was, it was one day, the, 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 the funny story goes, he was going back to sell his textbooks to the bookstore he had bought them for, you know, $1,000 total at the beginning of the semester. He went back and they offered him $100, right? So he was pissed, like, Whoa. you know, why, why can't you offer me more money? He went and looked on Amazon, saw he could sell them for more money. Um, and that's kind of where this, this whole idea sparked. So, so he started buying these textbooks from friends, students, um, started building lines outside his dorm room and just started listing them on Amazon. Huh. Um, it got to the point where he had too many books, had too many products he was trying to run on Amazon, needed some help, started hiring some friends. And then I, I was one of those people that he initially reached out to and said, hey, do you want a part-time job? I'm kind of starting this business selling these books. You want to help me out? So I got involved pretty quickly there. We, we continued to sell books for a few more years, really learned Amazon inside and out. Um, and this was 2009, 2010. So the Amazon marketplace was still very new. There weren't as many sellers, there weren't as many products, there weren't as many categories. There was still a lot of drop shipping going on as opposed to today where you see a lot more private label and wholesaling. And I don't even know if the Amazon Prime program was even a thing yet. So Whoa. we're, we're kind of talking, you know, wild west of Amazon here back <laughs> in the day. Um, right, right. And, uh, and so it was a crazy experience. Over the next four years, we, we built out the business to sell more than textbooks. Amazon went into selling toys and baby products and home goods to try to capture the moms and dads of the US. And we, we broke into those categories with them, going out to suppliers and brands around the US and saying, look, Amazon's a huge opportunity. You may not be selling there yet, or you're doing a small amount there. We know Amazon really well. We can help you sell your products more. Partner up with us through a dropship agreement and we'll kind of handle the sales through Amazon for you. And, and that's really how we built the business. And yeah, that's, that's kind of over the next four years, we, we sold a lot of products, we hired a lot of people and it, it taught us a ton about Amazon. But yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I, I can keep going. It was obviously- Yeah, no, that, I mean, this is fascinating. <laughs> so you guys were selling on Amazon, just to clarify, when it was just books. Is that right? I mean, there may, I think there was other categories too, but it was very small. It was, it was still known for, hey, Amazon's the place you go to get books. Whoa, that's insane. And what year is this? This was like 2009 we started selling there. Oh my God. That's so about 10 um, years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> incredible. Okay, so yeah. So, so you guys are building this business. Now you're starting to represent other brands, which is, mm -hmm. or work with other brands, which is really cool. And then, so where does it go from there out of curiosity? Yeah, sure. So at that point, once we, once we started working with other brands and we kind of found some, some home runs and, and started seeing a lot of sales with them, and our mindset was kind of, okay, how can, we, how can we replicate those home runs? How can we find other brands and suppliers that have really good products, have a good brand presence and do good marketing outside of Amazon, but they're mm -hmm. not yet taking advantage of that. And so that's really what we did for about three years. We, we had a sales team and we were just contacting anyone and everyone that was selling a product and trying to create a relationship with them, um, trying to build trust with them to show that we were a reliable 
seller they could work with on Amazon, and then just slowly building out our team to support those operations as well. Wow, that's cool. So, and then, I mean, from what we've talked before, but like this business grows, like not to like, a, you know, a small amount, it's like a pretty massive business. And then where'd you guys kind of go from there? Yeah, of course. So, so yeah, like you said, we, we get, we kind of blew it up a, a bit in the five years, I think we were selling, we sold over $25 million worth of product. And in our, our peak year, I think we were doing over 10 million in, in total sales for that year. It's incredible. And yeah. And it was, it was just a, just a crazy time. And we were super young, just learning on the fly. We had an office with this business and we had, you know, maybe 10 to 15 full-time and part-time people set up as employees. But then we were also introduced to this whole idea of outsourcing and hiring from platforms like Upwork and what used to be Odesk and Elance mm -hmm. um, from another entrepreneur we, we had met while we were doing this. And that was kind of a, a big transition for us where we said, hey, we, we've hired all these full-time people. It, it's a lot of overhead. We're, we're paying a lot for them. We're, we're paying for the office space. Is there any way we could start to support them with more remote people or start to transition tasks from the full-time people to the remote people? Um, and so that was a, a big transition for a couple of years where we were starting to build out that team. Um, and, and we very much ended up going in that direction. We eventually had a team of about 30 remote contractors that were working on the business for us as we were continuing to grow and, and operate everything. Wow. That's amazing. And then, so at a certain point, you, you kind of shift focus, it seems like from that, from that, like, you know, actual traditional physical products business mm. to, to free up. So kind of, um, yeah, tell us like a little bit about the, like that transition. Yeah, for sure. So that transition happened around 2014, 2015. And like I said, we, we had learned about this, this whole outsourcing deal. So it was super interesting to us. We, mm -hmm. we were seeing how effective we could be with our money um, and also just with the people's time that we were hiring and, and we were making great relationships with them. So that was always something we were thinking about and, and trying to understand the issues that were happening there. And then at the same time, Amazon was kind of going through its own transition as a marketplace where a lot of sellers were flooding the market. You were seeing a lot of movements from drop shipping to private labeling and people getting into the FBA wholesale program to take advantage of Prime. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also just saw a shift in the, the retail market where brands and suppliers were starting to understand the internet a little bit better. They were realizing that they had these, their brands and their intellectual property and all of these different things. And they were starting to make sure that they were being represented properly online. So mm -hmm. there was kind of this big shift that was going on. One that we didn't necessarily love. It was, it was kind of pushing us away from drop shipping. Um, and just kind of setting up other opportunities. And so that was around the time that we came up with the idea for free up um, and, we, and we started to pursue it. It was about early 2015 where we were starting to brainstorm, starting to put things together. Um, and then mid 2015 where we actually launched the business um, and we were running both of them at the same time for about a year before we decided to transition to free up. Huh. That's awesome. That's, that's so cool. And like, can you tell us a little bit, like, yeah, tell us a little bit more for those that, that don't know, which would be yeah, almost hard to be <laughs> now because you guys are literally everywhere, uh, which is awesome. But yeah, tell us a little bit more about like, you know, what FreeUp does and um, kind of like, yeah, what it's like grown into. Yeah, of course. So like I said, we, when we were using these other hiring platforms, we had a lot of frustrations ourselves. Mm -hmm. A few of the bigger ones were it just took a lot of our time as the owners to actually find good talent specifically mm -hmm. for Amazon. So we'd post a job, you know, we need a Amazon product lister. We'd get 25 people that would apply. We'd then take the time to look at their profiles. We would set up interviews with a certain percentage of them. And then we'd try to hire someone. So it just, it just took a lot of time to try to weed out those people that were a good fit. And then the second thing was we ran into a lot of turnover. So we would go through that whole process, hire someone, put them through onboarding. And then a couple of weeks later, they would disappear for whatever reason. And we'd be back to stage one. So that was just like a mind blower for us. We were like, how, how can we solve this? 
And then the last thing was just some of the other hiring platforms, they, they had already gotten really big. So we were just another cog in their machine. We were just a number, another number. And there wasn't someone that you could speak with or kind of go to when you're having issues. Um, right. So FreeUp is all about addressing those three challenges. And it's been that way from the beginning. It, it still is today because we, we see a lot of other business owners and entrepreneurs going through the same stuff. So mm-hmm. the first thing we do is we, we get thousands of applications from freelancers and agencies every single week. We put them through our own unique interview process. And then we only let the top 1% into the network. Um, So you're kind of getting access to this pre-vetted pool of talent that um, has already been looked at for their skills, their communication, and their attitude. Hmm. And then as a business owner, if you come to us and you say, hey, I need that Amazon product lister, we actually, we match you to one person at a time. You can talk with them, set up a phone call, you know, Skype chat, whatever you want to do. And then you're not overwhelmed by 25 people trying to talk to you. You get one at a time. If you want someone else, you just let us know. We'll introduce you to someone else as well. Um, and then the third thing is just we're available at all times. So our support is great. If you, if ever, if you ever run a turnover, we'll replace them immediately and then cover any replacement costs as well. Wow. That's amazing. Like, it's, such a, it's such a cool service. And yeah, I think, you know, recruiting is one of those things that I don't think, you know, first time entrepreneurs prioritize enough. And, you know, they're, they're constantly you know, working in the business instead of on the business. And so where you could totally hire someone really quickly through you guys that's already vetted and can kind of plug and play. Uh, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, that, at least that from, you know, very anecdotally that I've seen, you know, spend so much time like handling the support tickets and sure. you know, all their administrative stuff, like handling their listings and, um, and don't focus on like the bigger picture enough. So yeah, it's, it's really cool that you guys provide the service because I know like, yeah, before it, we had like our own like recruiting team, like mm-hmm. we spent so <laughs> many hours going through resumes. Sure. Yeah. So it's, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and it's a, uh, it, I think kind of to, to touch on a point you said there too, it's, it's also like um, for entrepreneurs, at least from my experience too, there is, there's like that like factor of fear for certain people too, when you're mm-hmm. going through the recruiting or, or just hiring in general. Um, like you said, you've seen a lot of people keep things on their plate. I was one of those people. I, I thought I could do everything to the best of the, the, the ability. And it was like, how can I trust to pass this off to someone else? Are, are they going to do it as good as I am? Um, they're on the other side of the world. Can I really trust they're actually going to get it done and not just try to, you know, bill me for time without doing the work? So, so I think there's a lot of mental things that, that go into the whole process of it as well. That's so true. Yeah, I get that feedback all the time. And like, so I've been like slowly like wearing my family and friends down like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like it's been probably, I would say, two years. And my mom, so my mom is, you know, obviously older than me, and she runs a business as well. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, it's crazy. She's She she works probably at least 60 hours a week. And Damn, since nice. I can remember. And I'm like, mom, <laughs> you need an EA. Like, you just, you need an EA. And, and she, you know, she's like, you know, what are they going to do? They're not going to have time. And I'm like, mom, like, let's just say, like, you know, we pay, like, a full-time person $800 a month. And let's say we, like, utilize them half the time. Right. Like, is that $800 <laughs> really, like, that meaningful to your business right now versus, like, getting, you know, 20 hours back? <laughs> and she's like, oh, wow. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, so it was just, like, it's just such a funny, like, way of explaining. We, we must have talked about it, like, eight times until she finally, like, let me help her hire somebody. Yeah, it's to- yeah. it's a total paradigm shift that you, mm-hmm. you have to like force yourself to go through. Um, totally. But I think once once it clicks, then like people get it. But it mm-hmm. like you said, it takes five to ten to fifteen times of explaining it until they're like, oh, that that actually makes sense, you know? <laughs> yeah. There's a great article I forget. I think he's the CEO of Evernote, and he talks about that, like how okay. in the beginning he yeah, I think it was him, but he was just saying that. You know, like in the beginning, he felt like he could program better than everybody and he could, yeah. you know, he could sell better than everyone. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, he could answer the phones better than his, <laughs> uh, you know, front desk person. And then he realized like, oh man, I'm just hiring the wrong people and I need to like, learn to let go. 
And yeah. then I, if I hire the right people, then it's going to change my outlook in terms of being able to do it better than them. So sure. that is really smart. And like at the end, he's like, oh yeah, so don't tell anybody, but it turns out I'm like the least talented person in the company. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was cool. Yeah, it's great once you can get into that mindset where you just, you find people smarter than yourselves, put them into the positions where they can succeed. And then you just stay focused on what you have to do to make the business grow. And right. it usually works out once you can get there, but it takes a lot to get there for sure. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally right. It's a, it's a total mindset shift. So I'm, I'm curious. So you guys hire, uh, you know, a very considerable amount of people, right? More than most. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Do you mind sharing some of like the hiring tactics that you guys use that would be like yeah, applicable to, yeah, especially yeah. The, uh, people like kind of starting out, they haven't hired a ton of people. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So my, my piece of advice for, for people starting out is, is always to, to really understand what's that one thing you can take off your plate first. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really overwhelming to, you know, look at your whole business and, and try to find a position or a specific role. But if you take 15 minutes and you, you know, open a notepad or whatever it is, and you, you start to write down all the time that you're spending on a daily basis. So, you know, for someone running an Amazon business, let's say they're, you know, they're spending two to three hours a day handling customer service inquiries. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're listing or optimizing their products maybe in an hour or so. They're trying to source new products. They're, um, you know, they're working on all these different things within their business. You, you kind of write those down and, and understand where you're spending your time. Mm -hmm. And then you can just choose one. Uh, uh, maybe it's the simplest one. So, it doesn't require too much of an advanced skill set. It doesn't take that much time. Maybe it's an hour per day that you could take off your plate. And then that's the thing you start with. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of to, to help yourself mentally, like we were just talking about, you kind of identify that first simple, not too much time. It's not going to cost you that much. It's yeah. not going to you know, have too much opportunity cost. You find that one thing, start with that. And that's where you can start to, to kind of learn and, and get started. Right. I like that. That's a, that's a good start. You're, you're kind of uh, easing people into the idea of outsourcing. Exactly. Yeah. You want to start slow. You can't just, oh, I'm going to jump in and hire someone, uh, you know, for 40 hours a week. It's, it's going to be super overwhelming and hire someone for five hours a week and you really figure out how to communicate with them and make sure they're doing the work properly. You're going to feel a lot better about it. And then you can go do the same thing or increase their hours. So yeah. So I think starting slow is always a, a great piece of advice for people just getting started. That is actually uh, a great piece of advice. Yeah, I sh probably shouldn't have just told my mom to jump in full time. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, lesson learned. That's, that's a good one. And so do you guys have like specific like interview tactics that you guys use? Like out of curiosity, do you guys use like top grading and who? Or do you guys think about it a little bit differently? I'm curious how you guys kind of structure that side. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so... So for myself with interviews, I like to kind of create an ideal list of things I want from the person I'm looking to hire. And what that does for me is it, it kind of takes out anything that's, if you just have like a vibe with someone, that's, that's important. But if they don't hit your, let's say, 10 key criteria for who you're looking to hire, it's an easy way for you just to say, okay, that's not the right fit. Let's go ahead and move on to the next person and see if they're that fit. And so the way it kind of breaks down is you could look at a number of things, right? So you want to look at their skills and experience. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for someone that is going to list products on your Amazon store, mm -hmm. you of course want them to have, let's say, one, two years experience doing that. Um, and, and they can answer questions pretty extensively about how they do it with their own process. Um, you know, it, I would say if they can't do that, you know, okay, that's, that's not the good applicant. You also want to look at uh, your budget. So what's the hourly rate that you'd ideally want to pay or the fixed rate that you want to pay? If they don't fit in there, okay, again, move on. Availability. A lot of the times when you're outsourcing or hiring people remotely, they may be on a different time zone. So is it really important that you want them working on Pacific hours or Eastern hours? If that's a factor, mm -hmm. that's something you want to interview and, and talk to them about. Um, so, you know, these are, these are some of those examples of this kind of rubric you can create of your ideal hire. Um, and then mm -hmm. as you're interviewing, you make sure you go through each one, you kind of flag ones that aren't working out and see if you can make them work. Um, if not, then you kind of move on to the next interview and, and keep going through the process till you find someone that hits all those check marks. 
I love that. Yeah, that's that's a really good. It took us a while to kind of figure. Yeah, we do something very very similar, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's like yeah, it's, it's one of the big things where yeah, we'd kind of hop on the interview and then realize, oh man, that was really important. We didn't even include that on the list, and then kind of like adjust the list that we're interviewing for. But um, but yeah, that's 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 super super helpful. Yeah, it's, it's it, I mean it's tough. We spend I've been hiring people and refining this process for eight years, so. People, mm-hmm. I think it's important to remind people that you're probably not going to find 100% success right off the bat. Mm-hmm. But if you go in as prepared as possible and also look at any mistake as a learning opportunity so you can improve as opposed to just saying, well, I tried it and it didn't work out for me. That's a much better way to, to approach it. It's, it's going to be hard to just go in and hire someone and it be a home run every time. You need to kind of look at it as a learning opportunity as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I really, I recently had this realization. It's so obvious, but like, <laughs> it took me a long, a long time to figure it out. Yeah. But it's like, you know, everybody has these kind of like mental roadblocks of what they're willing and not willing to do. And it's just different for, you know, some people it's like, maybe they're not willing to launch an Amazon product, you know, sure. some people, like for me, it's like, I, for whatever reason, do not want to invest in real estate or buy my like first piece of real estate. Like <laughs> <Right>. it's, <laughs> it stresses me out. But, you know, for other people, it might be like outsourcing. And sure. and I think it's just so fascinating because like inherently I know like if you do any of those things, you might fail, you might not, sure. but like you're going to get better if you do enough of the like uh, like the process going through it. And it's just such a funny like concept because I can tell people all day, oh yeah, just launch the product, just launch the product, but yeah. I can't go and invest in real estate really easily. And yeah, <laughs> it's been, yeah. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting one for me. Yeah, for uh, sure. And it's, and it's always smart to, to try to educate yourself as much as possible. And that's what I like to do. If I feel weary about something, I usually go and read articles about it, talk to other people who have done it. But yeah, it's still, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you still have to take that final mental leap to actually exactly. get in there and try it out. It's scary. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. But yeah, so I, I'm curious about, so this is one of the things that we've really made a big push on the last six months and I can share what we've done, but yeah. I'm, I'm very curious, like, you know, you have this, you know, hundred percent remote team, which is so cool. Like you and Nathan are not even in the same state. Amazing. But like, so how do you guys focus on like building these teams and keeping everything organized? Cause that's, that's a, a huge challenge in itself. Yeah. 100%. Um, something we've had to learn a ton amount and, and just try out different things. Yeah. So the way free up is structured now you have me and Nate, and, and we kind of handle different areas of the business. He's more on the, the client side, the sales side, um, and also just the internal operations and support. Whereas I'm doing a lot of our partnership, organization, marketing, advertising content. So right from the start, it's great that we handle different things. I think that's a, a key part of a, a great business partnership is people that have a, a similar vision for the company and business philosophies, but differing skill sets. So, so we kind of do that. And then we, ha- we have a, a great team of kind of leaders that, that work directly with each of us that handle different aspects of the business. So, you know, there's someone that's managing the customer support team. Uh, there's someone that's managing the accounting and bookkeeping team. There's someone that's managing all of the content that goes out. Someone mm-hmm. that manages advertising, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of have that core team around us that we, we trust a lot. Um, and then they have within themselves, there are 10 people, um, you know, this team has this many people, et cetera. Um, and, and we all kind of work together in, in that fashion. And for us, we use Skype a lot. That just happens to be one of the communication channels that works well for us. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'll have one-on-one conversations with people. Uh, we'll have, we have specific group chats for each team. Um, and then one for everyone where we hold all hands meetings once a week. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's plenty of ways. So we use Trello for a bunch of stuff. We use Jira for our developers. Um, mm. We use like Google Docs and Google Sheets to organize a bunch of different things. But yeah, it's, a, it's also something we've just built into our culture, right? So mm. if anyone wants to join our team, they have to be outstanding communicators. That's, mm. that's something we ask a ton of questions about in interviews um, to make sure that they... They'll share feedback. They'll tell us when something's wrong. They'll let us know about issues. They'll look for problems within their processes and give us solutions for how we can improve as a company. So, so yeah, it really just kind of comes down to the culture as well. 
that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to manage because yeah, we have people in I guess four countries now, and nice. so it's it's interesting. Like yeah, with a completely remote team. Every time we talk to, you know, like a business coach or everyone, they're like, oh my god, I can't believe you guys are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's been it's been amazing. Like, that's I, cool. I, and what do, what do you guys do? How do you kind of handle all of it? Yeah, so we I, I think it's pretty similar. Uh, so. <laughs> Instead of Trello, we use GetFlow. It's, I think it's uh, pretty similar. We had like our, our head of recruiting actually just go through, do, demo all of them. And then nice. that was like her recommendation. And so, yeah, we went through it. And yeah, we, we had used Asana in the past and it has a, a way better utilization for whatever reason. So nice. I'm happy about it. And then we use Slack very much, like, I guess, like you guys cool. use like Skype. Skype. Yeah, sure. And then, yeah, same Google Docs. Yeah, a lot of like collaboration tools like yeah within sheets and all that stuff mm-hmm. um and then so i really like the book scaling up mm-hmm. and uh so like a lot of what we've been doing recently is is focusing on like yeah the daily huddles and then we're we're implementing a new thing which is quarterly initiatives and then weekly leadership meetings and okay. then so the weekly leadership meetings involve like the head of the business unit, like all of their management team yep. and then all the supporting functions. So like recruiting, nice. Intel and finance all get into a meeting for about an hour and then just kind of go through um, a first round of like all the reporting of like how we're doing on track towards the quarterly initiatives. And then it follows up with any issues which we write down and then discuss at the end with, uh, with uh, action steps. And uh, or action items, sorry, and then kind of just assign them out, and then it just goes into the next week. And so that's nice. kind of a lot of what we've been doing. But yeah, it's so easy to get distracted with the non-important things. But we're right. trying to align everybody towards like the biggest things that we can be working on, and making sure that everyone knows they're due late and all that kind of stuff. So nice. It's cool. Yeah, it's it's an interesting challenge to like to really scale. But um. And do you do when you do your meetings? Do you do um do you do chat or do you do you do like video meetings or audio calls? How do you guys like to do it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so before we were doing like a lot of chat for just like you know normal tasks, yeah. and then, and then we would just call people like randomly yeah. through Skype because the the calling is usually better. Yeah. But you know maybe in November I realized like oh man like this is like terrible for culture. And so I, I just random epiphany. And then I was like, okay, from now on, like everything has to be video call. And yes. it, it's really changed. I think like the relationship between employees mm-hmm. and it's just such a subtle thing, but yeah, just being yeah. someone's like facial expressions and everything and just seeing everybody on a week to week basis, I think is really, really good for, for culture and morale. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I, we've, we've done it kind of both ways and we, we kind of go back and forth for different yeah. purposes, but, uh, but having the, yeah, the video touches, it make it goes a long way. It definitely mm-hmm. makes a good impact on your relationship with the people you're working with. Totally. Yeah. It, it makes it more than, um, you know, just someone else on the other side of the computer. And so that's totally. one of the things that we're, that we're, yeah, we're really focused on as, as we really scaled up our, our team. But yeah, so Actually, that kind of leads into my next question. So I'm curious, like, you know, having this remote team, have you guys found like really cool ways? That's, people ask me this a lot and mm-hmm. that's why I figured it's a good one, is like, how do you create like a good company or culture then or like a strong, mm-hmm. do you, have you guys found like cool team building events or anything in, along mm-hmm. that side that you can do while you're all in different places? Yeah, great question. So culture has always been something that I've been fascinated by with our, mm-hmm. with our first business. I you know, when we had an office, it was a lot easier, right? You can, you can have values that you, you talk about more often in meetings, you can post things on the wall, you can do different things within an office that exude your culture a bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, with free up, we, we've really, we've really ma- managed it remotely. And the way we've done it is we, we just, Nate and I know what the culture is very much so. And we have kind of values that define what that is and kind of who the people are that, that work with us. And, and how we think and how we approach problems and things along these lines, kind of what you'd find in like a company culture handbook, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the, some larger organizations will have those and they'll pass them out. And then uh, an amazing thing is the, the, that leadership team I was talking about, 
we've been working with a lot of them for three plus years already. So they really understand Nate and I really well and, and kind of the culture we wanted to build from the start. So it's, it's really, we don't have any crazy meetings or anything too innovative. It's just something we always bring up at our all hands meetings. So mm. we'll, we'll kind of talk about it. We'll remind people of certain things. If someone, you know, does something over the top or that's very much in line with the culture, we'll, you know, we'll applaud them for it and, and kind of make sure everyone sees the positivity surrounding that and, and really just be consistent with it. I think that's one of the biggest things with culture is as you add more and more people, are you consistent enough that they're understanding what the culture is and how they can kind of fit themselves into it? So we, we try to just be as consistent as possible. That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. It's it's uh, it's cool that you guys do the weekly all hands. I like that. Yeah, it's yeah. um, yeah, we do it too probably infrequently. We do it every month, so it ends up being really long. Yeah, but that's awesome, man. And yeah, yeah, thanks for this. Dude, this is super helpful. I think, especially for those that are are really like you know learning and getting comfortable <laughs> with yeah. with outsourcing. And yeah, I mean, oh yeah, one like the last question that I had was kind of like around the book. I mean. Mm. So, so yeah, you guys built, like, so you already, you guys built, uh, you wrote, you wrote this book and yeah, I mean, just, like, if you could just share a little bit more about it and kind of, um, how that came about. Yeah, of course. Um, so myself, I've always been a writer. Uh, I've, I've always loved writing. I've done it since high school. It was more private until we started free up. Um, and then around that time, I, I also started my own blog and started sharing, you know, kind of business philosophies and startup growth hacks, things along those lines. I still write about marketing and things along those lines today. So it's about a year and a half into the business. And uh, we, were, we had a lot of very close relationships with our clients. Um, and as we were building the business, we were very much building it around our story as past Amazon sellers struggled to outsource. Now we have a platform to outsource. Let us help you do it. And so the idea of the book came about from using that story to, to grow the company. Um, and so the book is just 50 lessons and stories from Nate and I's experiences running companies um, that would apply to people as they start their own businesses and want to outsource and, and kind of hire people remotely. So it, it's been a great little marketing piece for us since we released it. It was a lot of fun to build it. It was a lot of hard work and, and took a lot of editing and writing, of course. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a great project and uh, something we're happy that we have as a resource for the business. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. It's a cool tactic. I like that. Like, and I'm sure it's, it's also really rewarding to have like written a book that's like finished. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was very definitely frustrating towards the end doing all the editing and, you know, just reading 150 pages four or five, six times looking for little things. Um, oh my God. <laughs> it became a little, uh, um, a little detailed, but it was it was good overall for sure. That's cool. Yeah, I'm an audiobook person, so that would literally yeah. kill me. And I'm a terrible <laughs> writer. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for your time. I mean, is there any other like kind of like closing thoughts about like you know free up or anything that you're kind of working on that you wanted to share? Uh, yeah, sure. Just just kind of you know to the people that are listening. Like we were talking about earlier, I think starting slow is the best way to, to get into it um, and not lose too much money and, and kind of feel it out. I, I think the, the way you become successful outsourcing or hiring people remotely is by developing your own process for the whole, the whole system, right? So mm-hmm. like I was talking about before, it's, you know, how do you identify those things What's your interview process? How do you actually onboard the person, which is a, a very important stage? And then how do you communicate with them? A lot of the stuff we were just talking about. So mm-hmm. if you can build out your own system for those four areas, I, I think you get a much better understanding of what it takes for you as the business owner to make it work. Um, I think there's a lot of content out there that makes it sound just like, hey, hire someone for $5 an hour and they'll take everything off your plate. It's kind of like what it used to be in e-commerce where it was like, hey, build a dropship business and make a million dollars. There's there's a lot of noise out there, but you still have to put in the hard work to, to kind of build that system. But if you can do that, I think you can see a lot more success with it. So it's kind of going in with those right expectations as well. Totally, totally. Actually, and that reminds me of like uh, of another point that I didn't really touch on, but like yeah. you know, working with a company like FreeUp is awesome because 
it will help you decide or define your standard of hiring. And I never, I didn't think about this till like literally right now, but I think in the beginning, yeah, when we realized we could hire people for $4 an hour, we had like a really low bar, if you will, just because we're like, oh, this is so cheap. We're saving so much time. And we were just like, you know, whoever, like family, friends, it didn't like, it didn't really matter. Like we just needed to fill these roles. And then as we like started hiring better people, we're like, oh, whoa, this is like our new standard. Mm. And it completely changed the game where we ended up hiring way more talented people because we had that expectation. Mm. So working with like a company like Freedom, especially like in the beginning of this like process, is it's, it's really advantageous because you're kind of leveraging the, your guys' like skill set in terms of mm. hiring and understanding like, all right, this is like what I should be expecting. And then, you know, whether they decide to buy out the contract or like, you know, start building out their own team on their own later, like sure. that's fine. But at least like they now learn like what is a good hire. Um, and, I, and I think that's like, it's probably one of the most important things is to not have like kind of not talented people. I wanted to say shitty people, but like that's <laughs> bad. But like it's huge because you're not going to delegate to them. Like we're right. And, so, and you, it'll be harder to trust them too and harder to yeah. hire someone else and totally. keep kind of going on that path. So yeah, that's a, it's a great point. We, we fell into that trap early on where we just went for the lowest dollar per hour rate and we were like, this is awesome. Uh, but then over time we were like, this isn't so awesome because right. they're not doing the work at the, the level of quality that we want. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's a, that's another mental thing to kind of go through as you get started. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah, man. Well, if, if people want to get in touch, like what's the, the best way to reach you, Connor? Yeah, of course. So like I was saying earlier, myself and Nate are pretty accessible. Uh, we're happy to jump on calls with people and, and talk to anyone. So you can email me at Connor at freeup.com or you can go to freeup.com and there's a button to schedule a meeting where you have access to my calendar or Nate's calendar. And it is free up with three E's, F-R-E-E-E-U-P.com. Perfect. And I'll make sure the team puts a, a link uh, in the in the comments area. But dude, thank you so much for, yeah. for taking the time. This is awesome. And yeah, it's honestly really helpful just to kind of hear a lot about what you guys are up to. And uh, yeah, man, I wish you guys nothing but success. You guys, I know you guys are killing it. So Awesome. Thank Thanks, man. Appreciate you having yeah. me on. Of course. We'll talk soon. All right. Cheers. Bye.